walked in darkness My home was a night They came into my life Showed me brilliant light
morning, Meeting House. It is so great to see you. We're excited to have you with us here today. And in a little bit, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing with us. But as we start out our time, in the last book of the Bible, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are gathered together to make a sound. And it's a holy sound. So we're going to invite you to stand where you are and join in that holy sound with us as we lift our voices together today.
song for you this morning, and it's all about Jesus. So join in and sing when you're ready, but listen to the message of this song because it's powerful about what we give to Jesus, but what he gives to us. Even when I'm empty, I will bring an offering. I can never live a life that costs me nothing. I just want a real thing, no matter where it takes me. I refuse to pray a word that doesn't move me. All I know right now is I'm ready. Failure in the rear view, every doubt behind me, running with the wildfire of God inside me. Throw away a timeline, no more second guessing. It's plain to see my life is not my own, it's not about. and meets us. It becomes a shadow that we can stand under. So let's sing about really experiencing that part of our life with Jesus. I come to you with the weight of all my strength. Pick me up and you let me catch my breath. Lord, you never condemn, never make a list of wrongs. 
In the light of your goodness, all the fear I've known is gone. I'm safe in your arms, your arms of love. I'm safe in your arms, your arms of love. All of my heart, my hope, my trust is held. I'm safe in your arms, your arms of love. I'm safe in your arms, your arms of love. over us. And that's our prayer today, God. Thank you for being with us in this place. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Meeting House. Sorry, I was distracted. It's, I don't know what to do without football in the mornings, I guess, or on Sundays. Um, so my name is Marissa Mitchell. I am on the First Impressions team here um, at the Meeting House. So welcome. If this is your first time here, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. We would love to be able to connect with you, get to know you. We also have a, a gift for you. So if you are here in person, 
you can uh, go out to the um, desk out in the lobby. We have a gift for you. If you're joining us online, you can go to tmh.church slash new here, and you can get that information, and we can give you a gift that way. If you need prayer, um, we have a couple of different ways that, you can, that we can pray with you. Uh, you can join us after the service. We have a prayer team who's here who's happy to pray with you. You can also join us um, by texting the prayer line. You can, the uh, number is up there on the board, is up there on the screen, um, and that number is also in the description in the um, video. So uh, we would love to be able to pray with you. You can use that uh, text line all throughout the week if you need prayer throughout the week. Um, also, we invite you to join our prayer gathering um, on Monday the 28th at 7 p.m., where we'll just pray scripture over the meeting house. If you are new in your walk with um, Jesus and you want to know more about what that means, we invite you to join our discovery class and where you can ask questions like, who is Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple? How do I read the Bible and understand what that means? If you have these questions and you want to walk alongside other people who share these questions and want to discover more, we invite you to that four-week class, and you can sign up by going to tmh.church slash discovery. We also invite you, if you're interested in learning more about what it means to be a member, um, at the Meeting House, we invite you to join a membership class. Um, and that is, you know, you can see if that's the right next step for you. Just learn more about what it means to be a member here at the Meeting House. And so you can do that by um, going. There's one on Sunday the 27th here in Carlisle. There's also one on March uh, 13th in Dillsburg, and that's at 9 and 1030. And you can also learn more about that by going to tmh.church slash membership. And so now we want to invite you, if you are Um, We invite you to join us in offering. And so you can give uh, through a variety of different ways. You can give online. Those are up on the screen. You can text. You can also mail in that check. If you're here in person, we also invite you to drop off um, your offering in one of the uh, basket sets that are out in the lobby. And so that's just one way, again, that we can um, come together and serve God through the giving of our um, of our finances. So if you would, just pray with me. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for just all of your blessings and the grace that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. Um, I pray over the offering, Lord. I just um, pray that you just use our gifts, whether it be financial or our talents, Lord, that you use that to further your kingdom, Lord. And be with us today. Um, Open our ears to hear your message, Lord. And in Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning. I I almost feel like I need to reintroduce myself. My name is Bob, and uh, I've been away for a number of weeks. And uh, I haven't been playing hooky, though. I've been at our our, our Dillsburg campus the last three weeks. Is um, Pastor Dave, who uh, spoke a number of weeks ago, he is becoming the new campus pastor over there. And Pastor James Yutzi, who had been the campus pastor there, is moving into uh, an associate pastor role. And so we were making all these changes and, and doing all of that. And we did the installation of Pastor Dave last week at Dillsburg. And so all of that has gone really, really well. But I've missed being here with you and missed being in this place and getting to see your faces and the opportunity we have to 
um, celebrate in worship together. So um, here we are, and we're back, and I'm grateful for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Good to see you. Um, so this week I had a really, um, one of those moments in time that, that it happens and everything else in life just kind of takes a back seat because of the profound implications of what is right in front of you. Um, in, I, I had to ask this, but I, but I know in the Marvel world or in those kind of worlds, like Batman has a beacon that goes up in the sky with a bat symbol that he has to stop what he's doing and take care of something. Is that correct? And, and Spider-Man has this thing called a spidey sense that he just knows when something's happening and he, he moves towards that, that trouble. Or Superman has this ability to hear the little cry for help that's, you know, eons away and he hears it and he gets there. There are those moments for all of us where something happens, something so profound and important right in, middle of, in, in front of us that we have to stop what we're in the middle of uh, to pay attention. And this week, I had a, a phone call that came in, and it was from someone that I have not, a uh, good friend of the family, but I've not talked to her in, in years. And I answered the phone without really looking to see who was calling, and I answer, and there's just someone on the other end crying. And then I thought, well, I better figure out who this is, figured out who it was, and, and in that moment, just trying to figure out what was going on. Um, eventually, it gets to the point of finding out that, that she's come to the place of thinking it's just not worth living any longer, and that uh, she's thinking about taking her life and, and that this is um, done. No one cares. No one would miss her. She has no community, no friends. Her family is, is kind of estranged. And, and in that moment, nothing else seemed to matter in my world. You know what those moments are like. Of this person sitting, well, across the country, on the phone with me, like this person needed in that moment um, what I only knew would be the help of Jesus to, to meet her and to help her to realize that, that who she was mattered and that um, her life mattered and that God has been doing good things in her and that there is hope and, and all those things that any of us would respond to someone in that place. But what I know is, is where we are in Scripture today in our series in 1 John is this is, the, this is what it's like for, for the Apostle John who wrote this letter. He has been very aware of what it's like to follow after Jesus. And in writing this letter, he is, he is kind of putting that beacon out. He's, he's recognizing that the most important aspects of life reside in what he's about to talk about. That he's seen this reality in Jesus and his walking with him and, and journeying through life with Jesus over those number of years. And, and for John, all of life has been condensed into some very practical and purposeful ways of life that he's trying to communicate to those people who are following after Jesus in the first century and understanding what it looks like for our lives to be changed and transformed and, and to follow this new Messiah who is, is claiming that he has, is the Son of God, the one that was long awaited and, and been prepared for. And so as John puts this letter together, he, he wants to make the case so clearly that what is most vital for human existence resides in a relationship with Jesus and helping us to untangle and, and, and come to a greater clarity of what it looks like to truly follow after him. And that's the, the setting that's been placed. Pastor Zach preached last week, and he helped us to, to get a, a content of, of what's happening. He set the stage for us to see what it was there. He read the entire book of 1 John. And I would recommend to us, as we continue to walk through this over the next number of weeks, that that might be a practice that you would put into place two or three times a week, that you just read through the entire letter. It's not long. It doesn't take long. But as you read through it, what you begin to see is this pattern from, from John that is laying out these most critical and most important pieces of the journey with Jesus. And he does it in a really circular way. This might drive some of you crazy. It, it actually drives me crazy in some ways. I like to pick up a book or a letter or a part of the scriptures that start with A and then goes to B to C to D and it concludes. Anybody? Like that's what I like. It's why I've never been good with poetry. I've never been great with, with songs that repeat themselves a lot. Like I always think like just get to the point. Like just, just move. Get us somewhere. But I've come to realize, I think wisdom is, is beginning to seep in in old age, that there is beauty in repetition. 
And there's beauty in things not being linear. There's beauty in, in this circular way. And so the Apostle John, that's what he does, is he lays this out and he just starts layering and layering and layering the same things all the way through. And so as you read this, this little short letter, you think he's already said that five times. And he goes, yes, I did because I want you to grab a hold of it. And I'm going to develop it a little bit more this time. And then I'm going to develop a little bit more this time and a little bit more this time. So you can start to get all of the pictures of the refracting beauty of who Jesus is and what he's doing and, and what he's about. And so let's just enter this today with that sense. First, that we've been brought to this, this pinnacle point of saying, this is some of the most important message that the Apostle John, who was very close to Jesus, who walked with him, he he condensed it down. He said, this is what you need to know. This is how you need to know it, and this is how you can experience it that will change your life. And so it makes sense for us to lean into that and say, okay, what does that mean to hear John do this? And maybe us lean in, and maybe it has something to to say to us. And then of of realizing that as he he does this, we're going to catch just one side of this, this piece today. And we're going to bounce around to a number of different passages or a number of different chapters. And so if you want this to be linear, I apologize. I'm just trying to be faithful to the scriptures and be circular in how we do this and how we get there. But this is how he starts in chapter uh, two of the section we're going to be reading in verse three. He says this, we know that we have come to know him, Jesus, if we keep his commands. Now, have you ever asked that question, how do you know if you really know who God is? Uh, Somebody might ask you that. Well, how do you really know if you know who God is? How do you know that God knows who you are? How do you know if you really love God? How do you know this this relationship? Because it's really hard to to quantify and to have pictures of. But what we know in any relationship that we're in, we look for indicators that that would show us that the relationship we're in has, has value to the person that we're in that relationship with. They would do things and act in ways that would show that they find joy in the, in the relationship that we have. That makes sense to all of us in any relationship. I mean, if you just want to, to figure out what the opposite of it is, like go out to lunch and, and ditch the person you're with. And they'll quickly know like, oh, that doesn't feel so great. Or, or just be, you know, unkind to the person that you're sitting beside today. And, and you'll quickly realize like, oh, wait, you know what? We all have some expectations of what relationship looks like. And, and we would all say that absolutely, this statement is absolutely what I live with every day of my life. I know that in order to be known in relationship, it's indicated and shown and processed by the way that I live it. That's how Heather would know that I love her and that I treasure her. And so often I I fail at that. And I have to come back and say, oh, I messed that up. You know, let me try it again. And she graciously allows that to happen. But we we know that that's an important thing. We know that if you would, if we would sit together over coffee and in the entire time we're talking, all I did was, was spend time on my phone, not even taking care of emails or texts, but playing a game you'd say, you don't really want to be here. What's that about? That doesn't even even look like what we'd think of that. And so what what John says at the very beginning, we would all say, well, of course. Of course, that makes lots of sense. If we really know God, if we really are aware of his presence and who he is and, and his love for us, then we would come to a place where we would live under his lordship and under his kingship, and we would, we would act out a relationship that seems to matter. There's nothing, nothing crazy about that. But the truth of it is, what I want to believe in life, maybe what we want to believe in life, is that freedom is, abs- is actually an absence of boundaries. You ever, you ever think of this? Like, I have a lot of, of ambition and passions. I have a high capacity to want to do a lot of things that may not be good for me. Anybody? I have a, 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 deep, a deep sense of all the things I could be doing and I want to be doing and I should be doing in my mind, but I realize that if I were to do all the things that would just come natural for me to do, 
That is not freedom, actually. It would get me into a lot of trouble. I mean, it might even get me into non-physical freedom. Right? I'd find myself behind bars or something crazy. Because I, I, of anyone, have the propensity to go sideways on every relationship that I know of. I have the capacity within me, I know it, to disregard relationships around me and the people around me to do the things that I most want to do. But I don't think that I'm unique in that. I think that's actually the, the very core of our rebellion and what comes natural to all of us is we want to believe more than anything that freedom is an absence of boundaries and so that any boundary you put on me, anything that you want me to do or tell me I should do, and, and, and that would include what God tells me to do, I just need to break free of those things and do them. Now I'm going way back in time. Well, for some of you, this, I shouldn't say that. This, not, maybe not way back in time. For me, this is way back in time. I'd never actually heard this song, but I've heard a song that said these words. I did it my way. Do you know that song? I hesitate. I see some of you nodding. Some of you looking at me like, YouTube it later. Frank Sinatra's the guy. You've probably heard of him. He sings a song called, I did it my way. And I think, you know what? I resonate with that song. In fact, there's a lot of that song that I wish I could live every day. Wake up with no accountability, no restrictions, no boundaries, no barriers. I could just do whatever I felt like doing that day. But then I step out of bed and I realize if I were to live that way, I would be giving up a whole lot of relationship around me. I'd be giving up a whole lot of influence. I'd be giving up a whole lot of, or letting a lot of people down that know me and walk with me and have, have helped me to understand life more fully. If I did what Saint, what, not Saint, Frank Sinatra, but Frank Sinatra said, I did it my, if that were my life theme, it would not lead to the places that I think it would lead. In fact, what he's saying, and I'll just put it in a different way, is, is that the answer to life comes in being true to, to myself, true to yourself. We just get to do whatever we want to do, and that just seems so natural. That seems to make so much sense. But the Apostle John knew as he wrote this letter to the people that this was, this was emblematic of everybody that was ever going to walk the, the face of the earth. This was going to be our natural setting to live that way. But to live that way and being true to myself, it makes loving others an impossibility. It's impossible for me to live any way that I want with no boundaries and in any, any, any path that I want to live without being able to, or without destroying any relationship that I have with you or with anyone around me. What I quickly find out and what you found out in your life, because our, our histories are all the same in, in some ways, is that when I want what's best for what I think is best for me at the moment, it becomes impossible for me to extend love, grace, and empathy to you. Because I win. What I want wins. What I desire wins. And there's no curbing my appetite. But what Apostle John says, and this is what we're going to hop into, is he says that love is actually expressed as obedience. And obedience to Jesus being the primary picture of that. That if you really want to know that you love someone, if you really want to know whether you love God, there is a requirement of obedience. Doesn't that sound confining? I mean, isn't that irritating? Is that what you signed up for this morning when you woke up and said, the greatest gift I could ever give to this world is being obedient to Jesus? Maybe that isn't what you woke up doing. But my prayer is that as we keep walking through this letter, it will be something that the voice of God actually speaks to us and says that actually is where life is found. In waking up and realizing that obedience, finding out who God is, who I am in light of him, and then living that out will actually be the most free place that I could possibly live because I live in the very context of what I was created to live in. So he continues in chapter four. He says, this is love. I, I, I think there's a sense in culture for us just in this day of, of our existence is that we have love fatigue. We're just kind of tired of that word. 
We use it a lot. Wasn't it just like a love day this past week? Like there was one of these days that everything's about loving and flowers and um, Hallmark loves that day. It's, it's a great, you know, shows up on their budget well. Like that day. And we've, we've all come to a place, or many of us have come to a place, of saying, I'm just so done with that. I don't mean Valentine's Day, but I just mean love in general. Because I've tried it so many times. I've thought I've known what it looks like so many times. And this was the very thing that was in front of me the other day when I was talking to my friend, and she admitted, and she just kind of said it so many times, I'm so done with hearing about being loved because I've been abused and mistreated and taken advantage of by people that said they love me. And there is an undercurrent within our our world, within our day, where this is what people feel. I'm so sick of talking about love because it's been defined in a thousand, no, a million different ways. Isn't there anything that is concrete? Isn't there anything that is foundational to this? And And the Apostle John says, yes, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the foundation of everything we believe as Jesus followers. That God was the primary mover in the story of history. That God moved first. He moved to draw people to himself. He did the work. He sent Jesus. Jesus paid the the price of death on a cross so that the forgiveness and our rebellion could be dealt with, and we could have relationship with him, and this becomes the foundation of everything that we believe and everything we stand on. You'll hear a lot of things that we talk about on a Sunday morning or in our groups or in meetings or whatever, but this is it. This is where we land, that we know what love is because God first showed it to us by sending Jesus into the world that we might have life through him, and that provides the foundation from which we live. He says, dear friends, Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He says there's a conduit factor here. Uh, God loves you. You begin to then live out of that love with, with other people. But he says this, no one has ever seen God. Is that a problem? I mean, how many of us just feel like, you know what, if I could just see God today, I would believe this thing. If God just sat down beside me, and, and he just showed me who he is and, and showed me how much he loved. Like, if, he could just, if we could just see that, that would make such a difference. I would actually believe this thing. But instead, I don't have any proof that God's existing. In, in fact, if I, if I look at some, some research or, or whatever, there's, there's lots of evidence that would seem like he isn't there, that he's not a part of this story. And so we live in this place that's, that creates a significant problem for us that no one has ever seen God. And we say, that creates such a barrier for me that I can't get beyond that to believe that there's actually a being that created everything that we see and loves me so much that he would stop at nothing to come near me and show me. That just seems so foreign. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. There's this crazy thing that happens, according to John. This remarkable thing that happens. This thing that that doesn't seem to make any sense at all. God can't be seen, but he sends his son Jesus into the world, and through Jesus, Scripture tells us, through Jesus we know who God is. If you want to know what God looks like, you, you look to Jesus. And that's why we believe deeply that the scriptures are so important for us to to read and engage with and learn from because they reveal to us who Jesus is. But there's a problem. Jesus isn't here either. Like, yes, history would show that he was here and and he lived and there's evidence for that. No one would would say that that's contrary to that. But it's really hard because that was a long time ago. And even some of his disciples upon his resurrection didn't quite know what to do with him or to make sense of it. So what in the world happens now if God can't be seen, if Jesus is no longer around, then what? The Apostle John says, this is going to blow your mind. The way that you get to know God, the way that you see God is when you lean in and love one another, there's something that is completed 
in that place where God is seen and he's known and he's experienced. When you lean in and love one another, this is what takes place. What's at stake? What's at stake is that you and I and all people on this planet would know and see who God is. That's what's at stake for John. He says this this idea of love, it's so central. It's so important. This is the call that stops everything else that's going on in your life. This is the moment. If you need to pay attention to something, this is what you pay attention to, John says. Because not only... Are you wondering who God is and where he's at and if he's close and if he's near? You, you, may, you may say, ah, I can't no, get there. He said, but then he sent Jesus who came, who came so close and he showed you what God was like. Like when you see him act, that's the character of God. When you see what he concerns him, that's the heart of God. When you see where he, where he puts his attention, that's the heart of God. He says, but, but now that he's not here, What? John says, this is the coolest part of the whole thing. Is that you're an active participant in this. You're an active participant in God showing up in the world. If you're a Jesus follower, this is for you. If you're someone who said, yes, I believe who Jesus is. I believe he's the son of God and I've, I've, I've chosen to follow him and I'm walking after him the best that I know how. Like, this is for you. Is that you're vital to the mission of what God is doing in our world because he has chosen you and he's chosen me to show up and that where we show up and the way that we love people actually reveals God in that place. Here's what I know. Maybe it's some people in here. Maybe it's some people that are, that are watching online. Maybe, maybe it's your coworker. Or maybe it's someone that you, you know of. What I know is that there are a whole lot of people walking around our world wondering, what love actually looks like. They're, they're wondering if there's really something worth giving their life for. Living with a destination and a, and a purpose and wondering if it's possible that this life has more meaning than accumulating more stuff and getting a better job and having more money and, and all the things that, that create and, and contain our thoughts and our dreams. Is there something else that could possibly motivate us to live lives that are different, that that live lives that say, you know what, actually, when we love one another, God shows up in that place and it changes and surprises us to see life differently. Now I want to read through a number of places. Remember, this is circular, so if you've heard this before, it's okay. Because if you read the whole letter, you're going to realize this is talked about over and over. I could have used numerous passages. But here's what John continues. He says it this way. So God is love. This is chapter 4. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us. so So that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. He hands off our representation in the world is, is now we get to live this same kind of life that Jesus did. And there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And he he, here, this is such an important piece, right? Love is, or obedience, I should say, is, is has different motivators. Sometimes I'm obedient because I'm fearful. I, I try not to go too fast on the roads, Because I'm fearful of a ticket. Because that could cut into the golfing fund or numerous other things, right? Like, that's a problem. I'm I'm fearful, and so I'm obedient out of fear. But it doesn't create relationship when I'm obedient out of fear, very often. But there are some times that I'm okay with my kids being obedient out of fear. I'm okay with them um, um, honoring the speed limit as they're driving, because they're fearful of, of something. I, that's okay. But relationally, I don't want them to be obedient to me out of just fear. Over time, as we mature and we grow in our relationship, I would hope that my children are obedient because of the love we have, the trust that they have, 
the relationship that we have. That, that that's, that's why we do this. I was thinking this week, as, as I was thinking about uh, us, us as a church, and thinking, I don't know if I've ever actually thought about it in the same way, but there are many things that I don't do in life, or there are many things that I do do in life because I'm a part of this community. And because I love you, and I, and I trust and hope that you love me. That, that there are ways that I live and ways that I choose to, to go about my life that you are in the background of my thinking and often in the foreground of my thinking about why I would do something or not do something, why I'm motivated to do something or not do something. There's something beautiful that happens in a relationship when we're together in life that, that produces an obedience that ultimately leads to, to God's um, beauty and, and the trust that we have in him being experienced in our midst. And this is the, this is the glory of what, what John is talking about in this. He goes on, he says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he brings it really tight and really clear. He's like, if you want to know how much obedience and love plays in your life, think about the way that you're treating your brother and sister, the people around you, the other people that are on the journey of life with you. Think about how you're treating them. That will be the first indicator, the foremost indicator of whether you really believe that God is who he says he is and that you live life in him. And I think, oh, that's not a helpful litmus test for me because I fail at that one so regularly. He says it's not about like, like every single, it's about this, this movement of your heart. It's the, the all-encompassing way that you're choosing to live. The, the, the all-encompassing way that you choose to look, look at and interact with other people. He says, what I'm inviting you into and to think about, because this is what Jesus showed us, is that actually you will be most profoundly affected and the world around you will be most profoundly affected when you choose to live and love as Jesus has done and you can see that most clearly in the relationships and the ways that you love the people around you. I'm going to skip through some of these because you're going to read this over and over and over through the next number of days, so I don't want to, we'll, we'll get back to that. But I want to end with, with this, um, this statement. Is that obedience will always be inconvenient and costly. If you're, if you're kind of, <laughs> you're, you're reading through this, you go, you know, it would be really nice to love people well, but do you know the people that I'm supposed to love? I mean, have you seen them? You know the problems that they are? You know how difficult they are? You know how far out there they are? You know how broken they are? And it's in that moment that Jesus says, absolutely, because I have loved you. And the moment that you realize that your brokenness brought Jesus close to you, it begins to empower you in a new way to move close to those places and people that are equally as broken, and the opportunity to choose to love them well. And, and we may need to, next week, come back. We're going to talk about some things of lies that we believe that prevent this from happening. And we're going to get clearer and clearer on what it looks like to actually, what's love actually look like? And the cost of that, what is it that will move us forward in this? But if you, if you show up and you think, man, following Jesus, I, all I really want Jesus to do is give like his stamp of approval on the life that I've already chosen to live, you're going to be so disappointed. In fact, Jesus is going to feel like a useless person in your life at some point. But if he's allowed to be who he says he is in our lives, it'll be something that will cost us something. It will force us to think of life differently. I will have to give up some things. But what love does is it transforms that from being a burden to a joy. And it transforms that from being a, 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 a burden that, that weighs me down to something that, that I learn to truly find life in. Because I realize that what I have to give up 
is nothing compared to the beauty of what God has done in moving near me and giving me a relationship with him. But we only can start with where we are and with what we know. Not what someone else knows and where they are. And so I don't know where you are today. I have no idea what your life situation is or or what any of this might mean for you. But I know for John, this was so clear that it said it, he said it right in the middle of what he wanted this, this people that were following Jesus to know. That love was going to be really important to them. And love was going to be impossible without obedience. And that the goodness of what God was doing in their midst, that he was worthwhile following. And it was going to change everything. And so what I don't want to do today, and I don't want to end this way, is to say, well, here are the new rules you need to follow that show that you love. That's not it. Because as I said earlier, I I think I'm getting wiser the older that I am. What I've come to realize in 40-some years of, of following Jesus is that he is never done forming me into a more faithful disciple. There are things today that I continue to be convicted of, continue to be challenged by, continue to, be, uh, to have to confess and admit my, my brokenness. And God in that moment continually transforms me. And what is beautiful is that that doesn't happen by myself, but, but all of you and we together are getting to walk this journey to love one another in our brokenness well. And when we do it well, it completes a cycle, it completes a circle, and we see God show up. So here's some questions that I just want to leave you with to ask and talk about with with somebody that, that it's important that you have this conversation with. Because instead of just talking about loving God, just, just saying, oh yes, that's what we do. We, we actually bring it down to the, the grassroots level and say, what's it look like though when I go about my day? What's it go about in my relationships and, and where I am and who I'm with? How does, that, how does that look? And so here are the questions. What would love require of you at home, at work, at school, in the community, with your possessions, in your relationships? What, what would love require of you there? And, and just, um, yeah, this is, this is kind of how it happens, right? We, we start asking those questions, and then God kind of brings things to our minds. And so I'm going to just end with, with letting you know how this happened in my life this morning, actually, as I was doing my final, like, okay, what all are we talking about this morning? And I started writing kind of some thoughts down. And I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to be brutally honest with you, you need to know and help me to be accountable in a way um, that hopefully has the potential to change, to change what love, love requires of me at home. Because I've been really bad at this. So, um, you know, it's, it's always awkward when your wife's sitting in here and you got to say this. All right, so we'll ignore that she's here because uh, I'll have to talk about it later. But here's, here's what it is. Is I know that that one of Heather's love languages is, is words of affirmation. Words that, that let her know that I think she's awesome. And I'm really bad at that. I mean, really bad at that. Like, I take her for granted in that. I just don't, I don't verbalize. I think the world of her, and I think she's amazing and awesome. All this, like, even now, right? It's hard to say it. What is that? And, and I thought, you know what? As I, as I look at this and I think, what does love require of you? What it requires of me at home is for all three of the people that I live with to be much more thoughtful of the words that I speak to them because when I speak words of affirmation to them, it's, I speak life to them. It doesn't cost me a thing. But it's an intentional thing that I need to start thinking about. So, so you're going to hold me accountable for this, okay? So next week you have permission. Ask me. No, no, no. Don't ask me. Ask Heather. Right? Because I'll tell you I did it no matter what. (laughs) Remember that one time? No, no, no. You ask her. Like, it's about work at it. Will I be perfect at it? Nope. But I just know this morning that that was the one thing that God made very clear to me. 
Like if you want to be serious about thinking about loving your people at home, this is it. It might not be in that area for you. It might be in one of the other areas that God brings something to mind. And what we remember and what we hold on to is that when we choose to love, God shows up there. We see him more clearly and more hopefully. And guess what? The people that are encountering that, they see him more clearly too. Because no one has ever seen God. And Jesus isn't here anymore, though he is revealed to us through his word, but he's passed the baton to say, now you, you followers of mine, you're going to be the people that where you go and where you show up, that you're going to complete this circle, that complete this this hope that people have of knowing what God looks like. And when we experience that, our hearts are changed Our lives are changed. Our communities are changed. Our our homes are changed. Our church is changed. Because God shows up and reveals more and more and more of who he is. So can I pray for us to close that that one, that God would make us uncomfortable in some places. Remember, obedience is going to be discomforting and difficult and It's not convenient, but as it happens, he's going to be faithful to show us more of who he is. So God, I'm really thankful for this community that I'm a part of. And you just reminded me over and over this week that it is such a gift to walk with another group of people pursuing you. And we're all at different places and we're all at at different experiences in, in how long we've walked after you or Maybe we're not walking after you, but we're thinking about it, of what that would look like. And I thank you this week that you stopped me in my tracks numerous times through different people and different situations that reminded me that there are some things of life that are of most importance. There are some situations of life that that should cause me to to focus much more clearly on what it looks like to to be available to you to love people. And through loving people, it's a representation of my love for you that that all connects together and there's this almost mystical way in which you show up in the midst of all of that. So God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, online, our sanctuary at Dillsburg, all of us together, that that wherever we are in our journey, that today you would begin to lay something on our hearts to say, you know what? Love will require something different of you in this place, in this sphere, with these people. And that we would have enough, enough trust to move close to you in that and to try it and to do the best that we know how to do with what we currently know, and then we'll trust that you'll show up and do the rest. Because God, it's, it's what John says, that when that happens, things change. They'll never be the same. And so I pray for all of us that you would come near us, that you would show that to us, and that we would trust you enough to move into it, and then watch and see what happens. Thanks for our time together. Thank you for your word. And thank you for this community. Amen. Let's all stand together as we close our time out. Let the king of my
As we go into this week, thinking about, you know, what does love require of us? What that looks like for you as you pray about that. If you do already, maybe you feel something, you know, God calling you um, to something specific already. Uh, we do have a prayer team here who can pray with you um, or text that prayer line throughout the week as you go into that. So whatever that looks like for you, what love requires of us, it's going to be hard sometimes, it's going to be challenging, but there is just so much joy in, in life by following Jesus. So go throughout this week, have a wonderful week. Thanks.
Sometimes I feel like I done lost it And I don't even really know the cost yet But every time fear is on my mind You remind my soul that I'm free I know I can't go on my own You came so I wouldn't have to go it alone You took the long road so you could show me home 